Hi, this is Misha. In kind of our continuing series examining Japanese guns in closer detail, now we're at the original early war Type 99 Arasaka rifle. Now, the Arasaka Type 99 fires the 7.7 .7 by 58 recessed rimmed cartridge. It was essentially a British 303 without a rim. And the reason that Japan went to this heavier caliber before they had been using the 6.5 by 50 semi-rimmed cartridge in the Arasaka first Type 30 and later Type 38 since the late 19th century. And it did well as an anti-personnel but it wasn't doing great as anti-light armor or structure. This was brought home to them during the Sino-Japanese War or invasion of China in the late 1920s and 30s. The, Jap the Japanese were using 6.5 millimeter primarily, whereas the Chinese were using the 8x57 Mauser cartridge. So then the Japanese soon learned to respect it. So they essentially they took the British 303 and made it into a you know, analogous to an 8x57 Mauser. So they kept the same basic Arasaka action from the 38, but they took the opportunity to make some product improvements and to streamline the design. Beginning at the receiver, this receiver, although it's still the same Arasaka action, same bolt, system and all that. They simplified the forging for the receiver so it was faster and cheaper to produce. And they also took the opportunity to go to some parts made of stamp steel versus machine steel. These would include things like the butt plate, the floor plate, and barrel bands. So they did make some things easier to do. On the other hand, they added quite a bit. The Type 99 was the first full production gun to be adopted by military featuring a fully chrome lined, not just chamber, but also bore. They even chrome plated the bolt face. In chrome plating, because they were fighting in the tropics and the jungles and humidity in, near the ocean, it was quite important and it really gave the guns a longer service life. I have a cat crawling around my feet right now. In other words though, in other ways I should say, the 99 originally was the same as the 38. In fact they were going to produce it as a long rifle and as a cavalry carbine just as they, they had done with the, uh, the Type 38. The long rifle, which I'm holding here, has a 31 inch barrel. It features a protected front sight, long cleaning rod under the barrel. This rod is held in with a spring loaded button. You press this button here to release the cleaning rod. Kind of neat. It takes the same Type 30 bayonet that has been in use forever in Japan. We have a fold down monopod. Kind of a rest there. We have a half length upper handguard as you can see. Exposed barrel here. We have an adjustable peep rear sight with fold out anti aircraft arms. Doot. Doot. Same there. Now this feature is often derided, but a lot of places like CN Arsenal and others online have correctly kind of put the story straight about why these were put into use and how, though it was maybe an optimistic feature, it wasn't completely ridiculous when you consider that they were thinking about massed infantry volley fire on slow-moving um, World War I style era 
biplanes and whatnot. It, you know, they were never meant to be put up against P-50, you know, ones or anything like that. It was, it was older aircraft, you know. So at the time when this went into service, it made some sense. We have the same chrysanthemum on top of the receiver that's on all Japanese guns, pretty much. And we have the same sliding dust cover as on the 38. Yes, I know there are minor differences in the exact way they're made, but mechanically and pretty much just looking at them, they're, they're the same. Now, the long rifle has bottom-mounted sling swivels like a Type 38 long rifle would. As for the carbine version, it never went anywhere, I'll, I'll, aside from a few prototypes. It was going to have a, a 19 or 20 inch barrel, but they soon discovered the 7.7 millimeter cartridge out of such a short barrel gave a lot of noise, a lot of flash, and had substantial recoil, at least compared to the 6.5. They also discovered that a long rifle such as this, with a 31 inch barrel, really wasn't any better than perhaps a short rifle. So in the end, these were adopted in 1939, and by 1940 they were already out of production. They would only make about 38,000 long Type 99 rifles. Production would first begin at Nagoya, as that's where the primary work had been done on designing the Type 99 in the beginning. And then it would also pick up at Toyo Kogio, TK. <laughs> and then later, Kokura would begin production in 1940, although Kokura would never make the long rifle. Only Toyo Kogio and Nagoya would make the long rifle. Nagoya would be Series 1, Toyo Kogio would be Series 35 but both would stop by 1940. And that's the original Type 99 long rifle. Kind of a transitional gun. But it was really quickly determined that a short rifle, like this here, was the way to go for the new rifle and the new cartridge. This would go into production in 1940 and remain in production in one form or the other until 1945 as the substitute 99, but you would see full-featured guns such as this one being made until 1942. This has a 25... It's kind of a weird number. It's like 25 and 3 quarters inch barrel. A little less, a little more. Under 26, a little over 25 inch barrel. So, considerably shorter, quite a bit lighter than the long rifle, but still longer than that carbine. And it was kind of a one-size-fits-all and it worked really well. We have the same protected front sight. We have the same cleaning rod held in with a button. And we take the same Type 30 bayonet. We have a monopod here. This one's a little stiff, maybe. Come on, there we go. Now it's exactly the same style of monopod as on the long rifle but it is not, not interchangeable. It's a little shorter and held on a little differently than on the long. Now we do have a full length upper wood handguard now. We have the same style of peep rear sight with anti-aircraft wings. We have the same chrysanthemum. And the same dust cover. Now the short rifle does have side mounted sling swivels instead of the bottom style, but is otherwise the same in the back as the as the long rifle. These would be produced at nine arsenals in Japan, excuse me, nine arsenals total, seven in Japan, one in Korea, and one in China. Nagoya and Toyo Kogio would continue, Kokora would join in, and from there it opens up to several. In total, about three and a half million Type 99s of all variants and 
you know, levels of simplification would be produced throughout World War II. And they would keep turning these things out really until even after the bombs were dropped. They would keep turning them out until the surrender was announced. I mean, there, there, in theory, there were guns made that day. But we're, this video is really looking at the early production guns, the full featured Type 99s, the ones that are kind of getting really, uh, getting a lot of interest amongst collector circles these days. These are very well-made guns. In fact, they're well quoted for being the strongest action of any military gun. That's basically true. That, that test, which was featured back in a gun rag back in the 50s, was actually about the, the Type 38 Arasaka. But the Type 99, while slightly different, is still a very strong, very dependable action. Early ones like this would always have chrome-lined bores and chambers. They would always have the monopod, the anti-aircraft sights, the protective sight ears in the front. They would have lacquered wood stocks. They would have very nicely blued metal for a military rifle. There was a lot of uh, time and attention put into these guns, and they were very well made. This one here was made before the U.S. joined World War II. It's a very early production example, as you can see. I find, I find it to be in very nice condition. This is mine. And um, I'm just, you know, it's a really, to me, a good example of a for early war, for early generation Type 99 long, uh, Type 99 short rifle. The long rifle, while not as in good of condition, since there never were that many made, and, very, and they were all made early in the war, most every single one of these saw extensive service. This one was made by Nagoya. It's in decent shape for what these are, and, and it is matching. And it does have most of a uh, mum still visible. It's got a, a line out or two over it, but most of the long rifles you see, the mum's completely struck out. So, you know, I'll take a slightly defaced mum. I, like this is this one came from my friend John several years ago and really think it's a good exam good honest example of the long rifle but yeah just kind of wanted to show the early the early war the early production 99s we have other videos on the mid war and the so-called last ditch as well as several other Arasakas so you know we have some general overview videos looking at these and others and then we have these videos here which look at two or three guns in a shorter but more dedicated format but yeah the type 99 oh just before we get off here i was going to say that um the 7.7 .7 millimeter cartridge was supposed to replace the 6.5 millimeter cartridge completely but because japan was in the middle of an extremely heated war it never did they did quit making 6.5 millimeter guns around 1942 but they never stopped making the 6.5 millimeter ammunition so um you know, they used both cartridges concurrently. Both had their strengths and weaknesses. The Type 99 early on was, I would say, cheaper to produce. But then again, you have some flash and flare like the chrome line bore. But definitely the substitute 99s were about as basic as you could get a bolt-action rifle. Well, if you have any questions or comments, please post them below. I really enjoy talking about Japanese guns. Personally, I find them extremely fascinating. So really appreciate you tuning in to this video. Please check out our others if you haven't already on Japanese guns. If you like the video, please click that. Please subscribe if you have not yet. We really appreciate that. And as always, this is Misha, and we'll catch you next time.